So it's prosthodontic extraordinaire, Dr. Wendy Clark. Take it away, Wendy. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. I'm telling you, I am just blessed by the introduction that you give me. And Mark is one of my favorite people to work with. It's a real blessing. And like you said, there's really amazing um, talent and colleagues there. And I don't know how I got nominated or won that award because it's a, really there is a there's just amazing people um, and I was just telling um, Ashton and Adriana before you popped on that this conference is incredible and it's such a huge thing that you're doing for dentistry and I just think it's a really beautiful thing and I'm honored to be a part of it so thank you for uh, inviting me Mark so I'm going to get my screen shared up I know that there's been a lot of panel discussions so sorry to take you back to dental school with a powerpoint but I promise I will make it <laughs> not too boring um, everybody see that good? Great. So my topic today is my favorite topic of all time, which is digital ventures. Before I came to UNC about three years ago, I was um, in private practice for seven years where I learned that I'm an early adopter. And I really like to be an early adopter with technologies that are not as invasive um, and that are removable. So this kind of combines my passion for dentures uh, before I went to practice. When I was in dental school, my career goal and kind of my dream makes me a little weird was to teach the complete denture class <laughs> at university, which I did this year. And so now um, I've kind of come full circle and <laughs> talk about dentures and digital dentistry all the time. I'm going to do a pretty brief introduction about what digital dentures are. For those of you that haven't uh, utilized them yet in your practice, my vision is to kind of break away some of the um, inherent kind of misconceptions of digital ventures because there's it's something that you can easily incorporate into your practice as soon as you get going back. Um, and I always hope that people will start doing them Monday, to, you know, but I don't know if you guys will be in your practice Monday. So we'll go through the benefits, limitations of digital versus conventional and talk about multiple different workflows so that hopefully you can find something that you're comfortable with. A super brief history of digital, uh, digitally fabricated ventures and kind of my um, history as well. They first hit the market around 2012, um, which was a few years after I finished my residency, my prosthodontic residency program. And I fell in love with Dentca because they had a Gothic Arts Tracer Central Barrington built into their custom trays. And I just thought that was the coolest thing I'd ever seen in my life. So now you know how much of a nerd I am. Um, <clears throat> Avident came out on the market about the same time. And Dentca kind of went through the printing protocol and Avident went through the milling protocol. The FDA first cleared printed dentures for intraoral use around 2017. And so that's when we really saw the digital denture field explode. And so it went from just a few players to tons of players. And so now it's, people are starting to hear digital dentures all the time because it's not limited to these two um, pretty definitive workflows. And this is just a quick video for anybody that is intimidated by digital dentistry. And I know when I first started, um, going to lectures and see about CAD CAM, it was all these pie charts with thousands of arrows going around the board and the whiteboard and try to make it really confusing. And then I heard a lab tech, uh, Josh Jackson from Evolve, um, who really laid it out as simply as I've ever seen. And it's so true that every aspect of digital dentistry can be put in one of three buckets, data acquisition, design, or fabrication. So digital dentistry really is an easy thing and you could take any aspect. So you're making a CEREC crown, you scan for the acquisition, you design it and you mill it. And it's the same for digital ventures. So for digital ventures, the acquisition is going to be some sort of scan, either tabletop or intraoral. You're going to design your denture and you're going to mill or print it. So it's super easy. Uh, the other thing that I like people to be aware of is that there's not one workflow anymore that truly any step can be digitized. And so if you want to do a whole analog workflow and digitize one step, that's fine. If you want to do digital start to finish, that's fine too. So it shouldn't be as exclusive, I think, as we kind of make it and tend to make it sometimes. 
And I like to kind of go through the real basics of printing versus milling. And I'll make this really quick because I know that you guys have seen a lot of this. Um, and I've had the privilege of seeing a lot of your interactive panels. And so I want to make sure that you guys have an opportunity to ask questions if you want. Um, and Mark or Adriana, if there's any questions that you want to ask during my presentation, I'm happy to stop and answer those as well. Okay, thank you so much. Sure. <clears throat> so printing in general is a faster, less expensive way to digitally fabricate. So the CAM portion of CAD CAM and milling is usually stronger and usually more aesthetic, but there's exceptions to every rule. So this is just kind of the basic uh, blocks that they would fall into. Printing is going to be additive. So you're building it up. You have uncured resin that you're building in layers to create something. Milling is subtractive. I always say it's uh, like when Michelangelo had a block of marble and he chiseled out David. That's what we're doing with our dentures. We're chiseling out these little PMMA <laughs> works of art. Uh, this is just a real quick visual for what milling looks like. Um, you have big mills, little mills. Typically, uh, for digital dentures, they're going to be milled on a larger mill, so not something like a little Serac or a small E4D. It's usually going to have to be something bigger, like a VLAN mill or something four or five axis that a lab would have. Um, and you're going to have a puck, just like you would have zirconia or any other material, except it's going to be acrylic. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. So, <clears throat> For a milled denture, you can have a monolithic option, and they have a block from Avenet. Ivoclar has a block as well, where basically the white and the pink are housed in the same puck of acrylic. So it's kind of like an Oreo. It's how it was described to me by the rep, where they have the pink on both sides and the white in the middle, and the mill is aware of where the pink and white sit within that puck. And so it's built in the software to mill it out precisely so that you have the teeth are pink, I'm sorry, the teeth are white, the uh, base is pink, but it's all monolithic. So there's nothing bonded, nothing individual. It's a block of a denture. So this is gonna be your strongest and kind of maximize um, the tensile forces and functional forces. You can also have a bonded uh, denture where you're gonna have the bases milled and then the teeth are bonded into the sockets. And that was the first workflow uh, that we saw with digital dentures. Alternatively, if you don't wanna work through um, a specific company, you can kind of design and rig up your own monolithic denture. And this is what I've done with a lot of my full service labs, where you take your standard white puck of PMMA, mill that in whatever shade you want, A1, A2, A3, and then you just add some pink composite and customize that to add your tissue. Um, and so that, that's a few of the different options that you can see for milled dentures. And this is a visual from Avenet showing the milled denture base with the pockets where the denture teeth are gonna get bonded in. And with this bonded protocol, they're truly just bonded in with a cold cure type uh, autopolymerizing resin. The cool thing about milled dentures is they are made out of PMMA, polymethyl methacrylate, which is exactly what your conventionally processed dentures are made out of. So that means if you have somebody that comes in with a milled denture that breaks or needs a repair or needs a reline, you treat it the exact same way you treat a denture. So you don't have to invest in a new reline material. You don't have to learn a new protocol. It's all exactly the same. So you can reline, rebase, repair a milled PMMA denture the same way you would a conventionally processed denture. The other cool thing about it is that the PMMA is pre-polymerized. So basically the the chemical reaction goes, the exothermic chemical reaction, and then it's pressed into a puck. So you're eliminating all of the, um, the voids and the porosities and inconsistencies you may see with an injection or a press packed conventionally processed denture. So really um, that's gonna minimize some of the staining and some of the porosity, and it's also gonna minimize fracture risk. And that's kind of my real quick, quick and dirty milled denture protocol. Uh, the next form of CAM is going to be printed, so printed dentures uh, or additive manufacturing. There are seven different types of printing, and I could go on and on about printing, but I'm going to rein myself in, which is very difficult. Uh, when you're talking about digital dentures, digitally fabricated dentures, you're really only looking at that printing, which is going to be SLA or DLP. Um, and there's not one that's better than the other, SLA or DLP. It's going to depend on the type of printer you buy. So I like to show, these are the three printer systems that we work with the most at UNC. 
Um, and so carbon is kind of the, the Tesla, the high-end uh, Mercedes of printers. Uh, the, the price point for that is very high. It's about $150,000. And you cannot own a carbon. You can only lease a carbon over three years. So you end up paying that fee over three years. Um, it, quality is probably the highest as far as precision goes and uh, accuracy as for, for uh, dental printers. And the, um, the customer service is great because if something is wrong with your carbon, the carbon knows before you do, and it tells uh, customer care and then they fix it for you before you even know it was wrong. Um, the middle one is probably where most labs and most dentists live if they're doing any in-house printing. And that's gonna be kind of the middle of the road, your Toyotas, um, the kind of your if you want to buy a Camry or a Subaru or something that's give you your middle printer. So the Form Labs, uh, the Moon Ray, the Sprint Ray, um, the Asiga from Litmix, these are usually priced somewhere between four thousand dollars and twelve thousand dollars. And so there's a pretty significant leap from the carbon to this group of printers. And then the last is going to be your hobby printers. Um, and the any cubic photon and the frozen shuffle are kind of the two biggest players in that field right now. And those you can get for a couple hundred bucks on Amazon. So you're going from a few hundred dollars to a few thousand dollars to a hundred thousand dollars, basically. Um, and you get what you pay for, but depending on where you want to jump in, you actually can print custom trays. You can print try-ins. Uh, you can print little things on any cubic or the frozen shuffle. And you can certainly print anything on the middle grade printer that you're going to use intraorally. This is a quick uh, diagram because I'm a prosthodontic educator. I have to put in an image. I'm by law. I have to put in an image from a from an article. Um, and this is just a it's a really nice review of all the different types of additive manufacturing that are available. And this is specifically for VAT printers. So you have a bucket of resin, which is going to be that white rectangle in the middle, um, and it's like an uncured flowable resin, basically. And then you have a laser light source that cures that the same similarly to what your uh, curing light would do. There's a quick video about that printing for um, denture design. And this is from the, something that I worked with Dentka. Um, basically, in the software, you design the denture base, is what you saw in the first image. And then you design the denture teeth separately. And they both get printed individually. You can't print the denture teeth and the denture base at the same time. So that's one of the biggest time limitations is that you can't have two colors of resin in a printer right now. You can have white in a printer or you can have pink in a printer. So if you have two printers, you can print them both at the same time. But otherwise, if you have one printer, you have to clean out um, the resin tank and replace it. Those little posts that we're breaking off right now, those are supports that basically stabilize whatever item you're printing in your printer. They snap off pretty easily um, and they keep things from sagging and distorting as the print builds up. And from here, you take the denture teeth that were printed separately, you go through the same process. You have to handle them with gloves at this point because the uncured resin is not good for you. Um, and from here, they go through an alcohol bath to clean off any uncured resin and then those get cured um, in the curing unit. The downside with that first generation printing uh, that we see, and they're now calling it first generation printing, is that the materials are not tested very well. They were just FDA cleared in 2018. So we don't really have many long-term studies and certainly not a lot of long-term clinical data on them. Um, so typically what I'm using them for in my practice is for short-term use. So I'm using them for my interim dentures. If I'm doing an immediate denture um, and I'm really not comfortable with the aesthetics or with the centric relation record, I'll do a printed one as, as an immediate, and then it's a low cost, low stakes replacement that I can um, go to the next round of dentures and have kind of a nicer starting point. Uh, some of the issues that we're seeing are that you have to be real good with your bonding technique when you add the denture teeth to the denture base. And so we see issues with them fracturing and debonding. Uh, as recently as last year, so in the fourth quarter of 2019, uh, we came out with our first second generation printed resin. So this is available now um, through Dentsply. They call it digital lucitone. And it's really the most aesthetic uh, material I've seen yet as far as printable resins go. Um, this workflow for this material is super limited. The only SOP that's approved by the company right now is to design it on three shapes, which is a very expensive lab software, uh, and print it on a carbon, which is a very expensive printer. So we're getting really nice results, but you're kind of using the highest end software and the highest end printer to create this product. Um, the other difference 
with this material is that there's not an SOP to print teeth with this base. You can only use carded denture teeth. So basically, you, you're printing the denture base and then bonding the denture teeth into the sockets. Uh, again, the protocol is really nice, and they have you use the dense fly pourable resin to lock the teeth in, and it's a really nice cure. It's a really nice seal, and again, very short-term studies because this hasn't even been out for a year show pretty nice results with that product. And this is my biggest caveat that I try to teach my dental students, and we actually are teaching digital dentures to the dental students at UNC. So in their second year, they're learning about digital dentures, and in their third and fourth year, they're actually fabricating milled dentures. Um, on the clinic floor. We're pilot testing, doing some printed dentures with a fourth year dental students. But right now it's a pretty common workflow for the students to do milled. Um, Loma Linda in California has switched to all digital dentures. So they're not even using wax anymore uh, at Loma Linda. So they're a, a little bit ahead of the curve now. And I've, um, I've contacted uh, Brian Goodacre there. It's, just, it's a really cool thing. And it's kind of interesting to see where this industry is going. But it is important to know as private practitioners that the dental students coming out of these dental, uh, dental schools will have exposure to digital dentures in their uh, arsenal of care. So with printed dentures, again, I want the dental students to understand this, is that they're not PMMA. They're made of something similar to PMMA, but not quite PMMA. So sometimes you can use your relay material and have it adhere, and sometimes it peels right out or doesn't stick at all. Um, it has, usually has some sort of bisacryl composite, so if you needed to do a repair, you could certainly use some composite and cure it, but it's going to be a pretty short-term solution. Um, and the philosophy is these are almost disposable dentures, and so if something happens to your printed denture, repair it real short-term, call your lab and have them print another one, which kind of leads us into the benefits versus conventional dentures. Are you doing good, Mark? Any questions about anything? Great. I will keep talking then. So when compared to conventional dentures, the way that I learned in dental school and probably all of you learned in dental school is a five-step painstaking process, starting with an alginate, making a custom tray, border molding with some sort of uh, compound, and then using polysulfide or whatever, record bases, all that. Uh, lots of wax involved and lots of very long appointments. And so kind of the, the biggest selling point for um, private practitioners is that this, all the protocols are shorter. The average digital denture workflow is about 2.65 visits versus five something for conventional. So you're cutting your uh, appointment number in half, which is really great for our denture population because a lot of them are uh, medically compromised or um, a little bit older or they have difficulty getting to the, the clinic. And so one of my biggest um, visions is right now there's a serious access to care issue for edentulous patients and there's not enough providers to make dentures for these patients. And it's a really underserved community um, that are usually rural or in places where they don't have as many uh, providers that provide the service, if we can make dentures accessible to those patients through digital, I think we'll have done something really beautiful. And so that's what I'm hoping that um, this service can kind of help close the gap for the access to care for edentulous patients. Dr. Clark, we do have a couple questions. And if it doesn't fit right here, if you're going to speak on it later, we can um, go there. But Dr. Alvarez asked what reline material, material is recommended by you? Uh, and that, that will depend on whether it's printed or milled. For a milled denture, use anything that you would normally use. So whatever your favorite one is. Um, my favorite chair-side hard material is uh, GC chair-side hard. GC chair-side hard. I don't know why I can't say that right now. GC chair-side <laughs> hard. Uh, and then they also, GC has a really nice silicone material that comes out of a squeezy gun like PVS. It's a little bit more expensive, but it sticks a lot better and it doesn't get as funky <laughs> as some of the other relines. It doesn't smell as bad. Um, for printed, that same, um, both of those GC materials work. You just have to load it up with um, monomer, in my experience, which may be good, may be bad, because there's a lot of free monomer. It's just with printed, the best thing to do is to remake it if you can, to take a new scan and remake it. Okay. I have a couple more if you're open to it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sure. Uh, Claudia asks, how does digital dentures compare to the conventional dentures in terms of adjustment appointments? 
That's a phenomenal question, and there are not a ton of studies on it. There is one study that was relatively recently published, and we are actually trying to run a study right now with a few of our dental students at UNC. Um, and what we've seen is that there are fewer post-operative adjustments with digital versus conventional, and that's particularly with milled, not with printed. So with milled, we're seeing um, probably half, roughly half the adjustment time. Okay. And then how do you confirm proper border molding with a digital impression? That is great, and that's coming up next. Oops, sweet. There is also one love more. That stuff. <laughs> there are so many good questions. I think we opened a can of worms. You are going to be a hot topic for questions. You're very, it's fascinating. I absolutely love your presentation. Thank um, you. And how does the work order work for using an aesthetic try-in to confirm tooth position and phonetics? That is perfect. And that's coming up in my workflow section. Awesome. So hang tight. <laughs> the last one is, is it Avident? I'm not sure about the pronunciation. <laughs> Avident yeah, needs Avident. able to accept design files from Exacad, keeps moving, for example, so they can incorporate a face scan, for example, from Bellis. Not exactly what the question is. I know what all those, I know what that question means, and I don't know what they do right now. Mm -hmm. um, they have their own proprietary software, and so if you, if you sent them a scan with a face scan, they could probably upload it and use that to kind of merge their designs. And so what you would end up getting would be a digital preview of the digital setup versus a proposed setup, but it wouldn't be your exact setup from Exacad, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, some of the other labs with more open workflows would probably certainly be able to do that. I've worked with um, Row Dental in Cleveland in particular and um, Absolute Dental in Durham. Um, and Olson Dental in Michigan and Oral Arts in Huntsville have all been really, Huntsville, Alabama, have all been really open to playing with different workflows. And so I would recommend any of whoever's closest to you for that. And do you have a 3D printer for office use that you recommend? They use an iTero. Uh, yeah, so you, there's so many good ones and it really depends on what you're wanting to print. Um, if you can go on Facebook, Marco Tadros has a ton of resources on 3D printers. Um, he has a three, 3D, 365 digital dentistry uh, group that is phenomenal. Um, he likes, and I've had really great results with the Asiga. It's a little bit higher price point. It's closer to ten or 11000 It's from Whitmix. Um, if you just want something real simple and straightforward, Formlabs is coming out with a new printer. The Form, uh, I can't remember what it's called. I think it's Form 3D or something, which is fine. Um, and the Moonray, the Sprint Ray is really nice. Okay, thank if you. you. Want now we'll let play, you get back to get your the photon. awesomeness. <laughs> no, thank you. You guys are awesome. Um, so one of the other phenomenal things is that you're preserving all those records. And so when you start doing a denture in wax, the first thing you do is demolish all the wax. And so you make a wax rim, you contour it, you spend hours and hours and hours, and then you melt it away to put the teeth on. With digital, you'll see as we go through the workflows, you preserve every single stage of your diagnostics. Um, we had asked about post-ops. There was a really nice study done by Palo Sapinaro out of Ohio State um, where they did basically a side-by-side -side study where the patients got, uh, that had conventional dentures got digital dentures and vice versa, and they compared the groups. And all the patients there liked every aspect of digital dentures better. Uh, we did a similar pilot test. It's not published or anything like that at UNC, and we found really similar results that patients tend to really like the fact that it's digital. So that's kind of my basic, that's what digital dentures are, that's why they're cool, and now I'm going to walk into a few different workflows. So kind of the basic cookie cutter is you take some sort of impression, you either scan it or the lab scans it, then you do some sort of trial denture, and then you make something. So this is the acquisition design fabrication from that earlier slide. So you have your um, acquisition of data, your CAD design, and your CAM fabrication. And you can take any impression. So you had asked about border molding with digital. Um, the scanners are getting better and better and better, but they're still not really border molding because you can't um, pull that tissue down and scan it at the same time. You can only scan something static. So you can get a good scan and capture the mucogingival junction, which will give you a pretty good idea about where the border is, but you're not truly border molding yet with a scanner. Um, however, if you 
take a scan for your first step, at some point you can pick up border molding and we'll walk through some of those steps. And usually it'll be at the trial denture phase. You'll basically, from your scan, you'll print something and then border mold inside that. So sadly, we cannot get rid of border molding yet, but we can get rid of the wax. <laughs> so you can start with an alginate. You can start with a border molded impression in a, um, in a final tray, like a Mossad tray or a Wagner tray, uh, which are both really phenomenal options for final impressions or a Denka tray even. And usually, again, we don't scan. And so that's, again, one of the, him the inhibitions I've seen for people to start digital dentures is they don't want to do them because they don't have a scanner. But that doesn't matter because your lab probably has a scanner. So if you take a conventional impression, uh, you'll send that to your lab and then they'll scan it in. And we'll talk about that workflow in a moment. Uh, there are several now um, proof of concept and case reports where people are using intraoral scanners. Um, and again, at some point, they're picking up the border molding down the line. Um, one of my students, my fourth year students, I had asked her to scan a denture and she accidentally scanned the arch and it was phenomenal. And so I'm like, well, if a dental student can do it, I can do it. So this middle image is my first attempt at trying to scan an arch. And the maxilla is pretty easy to scan. The mandible is rather hard, especially on the lingual surface, because it's hard to keep the tongue from not moving. So if the patient breathes or swallows or moves, then it kind of messes your scanner's image up. So once you have an impression, you need to get some sort of maxillomandibular relations. And again, this can be as basic as a wax rim. If you want to make a quick wax rim on an alginate, if you want to take a scan and print a record base and put some wax on it, you can do that too. Uh, but you need some sort of MMR. And fortunately, you have many, many, many options. So certainly there should be something that fits into your workflow. Um, the top left is kind of the most basic where you're going to have some sort of wax rims and border mold inside those. Um, the, we'll talk a lot about the monolithic try-in as well as the Wagner try-in, which is the bottom middle image. And you see I even managed a way to work in a Gothic arch tracer <laughs> into a digital workflow in the upper right corner. So um, you can, again, make it as digital as you want to. So we've done our impressions, some sort of record, and then we're going to do a try-in. Again, we're not limited on options here. The far left, you're gonna see a milled or printed, but usually a milled record base with teeth set in wax. Um, Avidet would call this the advanced try-in. Um, this one I think is probably the most limiting. You think that since there's wax, you can move the teeth a lot, but because the sockets are milled so precisely, you can really only move the teeth a little bit. You can kind of tweak them here and there. You can't really shift them in position the way you can with a true wax setup. Uh, the monolithic trine is probably the, mo the growing the most in popularity right now. And so I think my vision of dentures for the future is going to be mostly these monolithic trines, which is the second image in. Uh, the third, third image over is a Wagner trine that we'll talk about, the kind of a combined trine wax rim. And then the final one is a printed denture. So if you have an in-house printed denture, you have somebody that has a pretty reasonable MMR go ahead and print the final denture. You may be able to skip your trying appointment completely. And the cost of these printed resins and the cost of the printers are a pretty low price point. So if it doesn't fit, you throw it in the garbage, use it as an MMR record, wash it, take a new bite, scan it in, um, and design the final. If it does fit, then you've saved your patient a trip and you've saved yourself an appointment of chair time. And once you've done your try-in, you will go to the last step, which is the CAM. So you will either mill or print your definitive denture. And uh, now I'm going to walk through three separate, pretty basic workflows that I would say basic for digital dentures. Um, I like this picture because it looks like it's some sort of resin, but it's actually a jellyfish. <laughs> so, um, well, we'll talk about the Wagner try and workflow, which is, again, kind of a, an introductory workflow that we're working with the dental students, and it's the same one that Loma Linda is using. Uh, talk about immediate dentures and duplicate dentures, which I think are probably the two easiest ways to jump into digital dentures. So the Wagner workflow is what our UNC students are doing in their fourth year um, because we're prosthodontists and we like to torment people and we want them to have good experience. We are still actually having them make and pour alginate impressions and make custom trays uh, and border mold. Don't tell them that there's other alternative, please, until they graduate. <laughs> Um, and so they are still border molding inside custom trays. We're using heavy body PDS with a light body wash. Um, and then from here, we are sending our impressions to Avidant and they are scanning them in. 
Um, and so basically, like I said, if you don't have a scanner in house, if you don't have an optical scanner option and after COVID, you don't want to make a huge investment like that, go ahead, take an impression, send it to your lab and have them scan it in. Because most full service labs at this point have some sort of optical scanner they can use. Either an intraoral scanner or a benchtop scanner is going to create an STL file. Um, so this is a scanned impression. This is basically what you would see. You see we captured all the border molding. You can see the edges. You can see all the anatomy. Um, so your digital impression has to be as accurate as um, anything else you would do for complete dentures. And again, just looking to see all the anatomy, you want to make sure that you evaluate this as critically as you would any final impression. So you want to see the retromolar pads. You want to see the hamular notches. And it's arguably more critical for you to capture all the anatomy in this impression because the way that the software works. And I'll walk through that in just a moment. If you're following the Avident workflow with a Wagner try-in, you're going to capture something called Wagner records, which the, main, the most important ones are going to be the lip at rest and high smile. And those, again, get input in the software to help position that incisal edge. Um, <clears throat> from here, the scanner... Uh, the software will find several points on your scanned impression. So they'll look for the incisive papilla, they'll look for your hamular notch, they'll look for your frena, they'll look for um, midline suture, your retromolar pads, all that stuff. And it inputs that data into an algorithm, which comes up with an ideal setup. Um, and so that's kind of the, the, one of the things that I think is really cool is that um, I, when I first started doing digital dentures, I like to challenge the computer. <laughs> so I would do a setup and have the computer do a setup and see which one was better, and the computer always won, uh, which is very humbling <laughs> for prosthodontists. Um, and the Wagner measurement of the lip length at rest and the high smile is going to tell the computer where the incisal edge position should be for that maxillary denture. Um, all the stuff that you probably or maybe learned in dental school about using the um, – the ALA meter and the papilla meter, all that stuff, the, all that stuff is built into the software, which I think is really phenomenal. So this is the Wagner try-in. This is what we're using in school because it's a really easy transition for faculty that are used to um, doing wax tooth try-ins for their whole career. And it's also easy for us to teach some of the basic concepts. So here you can see the front eight teeth are set in wax on the upper arch. So you can move those around forward, backwards, side to side, the same as you would a wax setup. They're not locked in like they are on that advanced trying because this is not a milled. The intaglio of this base is milled, but the sockets are not milled, if that makes sense. So it's basically a wax rim. Um, and then you have wax rims in the posterior area, so you can open up vertical, close vertical, catch your centric, the same way you would with wax rims. One of the things I love about this is that the flanges are extended to where your definitive dentures would be extended. So if you've been doing a lot of removable, this would be very um, akin to a process record base. So if you do a process record base in a conventional workflow, it's an additional fee and an additional um, lab step, but you end up taking your MMR records and doing your clinical try-in with something that fits like a denture base. And you know if your denture is going to fit at insertion, because I think one of the reasons we hate doing dentures as clinicians is because they're super unpredictable. And you could do everything perfectly, and then the flask opens up, or um, then the, the base doesn't adhere right during processing, or something just goes wrong. Um, and uh, you could do everything perfectly, and then you go to seat your denture, and I think every single clinician that does dentures knows that feeling of trying to seat a maxillary denture, holding your breath, then slowly stepping away and see if it falls right down. Um, exactly. <laughs> so uh, when you do something like this with a, with a digital record base, you're now replicating the extensions. So you know at the try-in appointment if you're going to need to be terrified at the insertion appointment or not. If your record base, if your, everything was extended appropriately, this Wagner try-in should fit identical to an ideal complete denture as far as the bases go. So now we don't have to be scared anymore because we know um, if you don't have good retention and if it's not adequate, then you will do a wash impression and modify the bases so that you get it. So, and we'll walk through some of that with a monolithic try-in step. Once you send your Wagner try-in back to um, Avident or to your full service lab, they're going to send you some form of digital preview. And this is the Avident version. Again, 3Shape has one. Um, Exacad has one, whatever software your technician works with, you're going to receive something similar to this to evaluate. 
where you can see where the teeth are in relation to each other. So you can evaluate occlusion, you can evaluate incisal overlap, you can evaluate um, where it sits compared to the retromolar pad, is it directly over the ridge? Uh, I gave a similar lecture to some prosthodontists, some really smart prosthodontists in Memphis last week, and they were asking about how a lot of times technicians will kind of set teeth in the wrong spot to accommodate aesthetics or to follow wax rims, because you can't see the cast when you're putting teeth on the ridge. Now you're seeing the cast, and so there is no um, are we in the vestibule? There is no, are we violating the tongue space? The computer sets the teeth directly over the center of the ridge, and you have to actually move them if you want them to be away from ideal, which is kind of a cool thing. Uh, the second slide, if you, you can pull up a grid, again, this is in most softwares, where each square is a millimeter. So you can evaluate acrylic thickness. You can evaluate if you want the lateral incisor moved down exactly a millimeter or two millimeters. If you want the buccal corridor built out two millimeters, you have exact numbers here rather than having your technician guess. And then the final slide is versus your reference. And if you look here, this is if you're duplicating a denture, the purple extension is going to be whatever you scanned and sent in. So this could have been a wax tooth try-in, this could have been an existing denture, this could have been an interim denture, or even natural dentition, and I'll show you some examples of that. If you do a wax rim, you are no longer melting away all of that work you did to carve your wax rim. And so right now, you can see where those denture teeth sit in relation to where you put the wax rim. So you can see where you scored the high smile line, you can see where you scored the midline, all of that data is there. And so if you built out, let's say your patient has um, some asymmetries that you want to correct with a tooth setup, now you can see in wax where you've built out that tissue support and you can make sure that your lab is putting the teeth um, in the exact same spot to give you that predictable result. So again, we're eliminating a lot of the lack of predictability with complete dentures. Uh, the last step of this workflow would be to choose your milled option. And again, you could do a monolithic milled or you could do a bonded tooth setup. The benefit to bonded teeth is really going to be the aesthetics. Um, again, and this is, I think, a prosthodontist thing, but a lot of people don't like the way the milled denture teeth look because they're more opaque than a conventional denture tooth. And so they say they're not as aesthetic. So if you really, you and your patient are concerned about the aesthetics of a denture tooth, you're going to want to choose a bonded option um, or have your lab customize it afterwards. The next two workflows are much shorter. <laughs> So I'll walk through those real quickly, and then I'll, I should have a few minutes to answer questions. Um, <clears throat> for immediate dentures, this was my next favorite solution because, um, again, the, I think the only thing more terrifying than trying to insert a conventional denture and not knowing how it's going to fit is trying to insert an immediate denture. And you have no clue where those teeth are going to be. They might be upside down, they might be backwards, and they might even be for another patient. Uh, but now, if you do a digital workflow, you can take a trio scan of the patient's pre-existing dentition or take an alginate and scan that in. And now we are using the patient's teeth, not grinding them off the cast and arbitrarily guessing where the denture teeth go, but we are now setting the denture teeth virtually compared to landmarks that we have not ground away or lost, which I think is really cool. Um, and so this is to me kind of the, the big image here is the superimposed pre-treatment, pre-extraction cast over the proposed setup. So I know that they're not setting these teeth way out in the vestibule. I know that my patient's not going to leave with buck teeth or with too much lip support or not enough lip support because they're putting those teeth exactly where the patient's existing teeth were or were not where the existing teeth were if they were in the wrong spot. But now you have some sort of reference and it's not all obliterated by grinding away stone or melting wax. So to me, this is kind of my next favorite solution. Um, and kind of a real simplified version of that workflow. Either grab an intraoral scan if you have one, um, any scanner is fine, or take an alginate impression, PVS impression, send it to your lab for them to scan in on their benchtop scanner like we discussed earlier. Uh, I think this is so cool, <laughs> and this is coming from a prosthodontist, that the virtual face bow can now be as accurate <laughs> as a conventional face bow. So I'm not telling you to throw your face bows away. <laughs> but you have another solution. Um, and if you can take a full face photo with a patient looking straight forward, so they have to be looking straight ahead, and it's okay if they're canted this way or this way, but they can't be canted this way or this way. It has to be straight on. Um, and you can have them tuck their hair behind their ears if they have long hair. 
so that you can visualize their ears where their con condylar element would be. Um, and basically, you can take that photo and superimpose it over the virtual articulator, and you've now done a face mount transfer, which I think is phenomenal. And this is just the three shape software, again, that the majority of lab technicians are using now. Um, and all you need for this is a full face photo. So again, there's no big investment of technology. Uh, you can set your intraoral camera to your full face setting, because I know you guys all have intraoral cameras, because Dr. Hyman told you about them. You can use your iPhone. You can use a DSLR. You can use your Canon camera from the 90s that you found in your closet. As long as you take a full face photo where the patient's looking forward and you can see their ears, now you've given the lab a plethora of information. And I want everybody to remember that digital smile design is also for dentures. It's not just for patients with teeth and veneers. So you take your full face photo, the lab in the three shape software or Exacad or by Blue Sky Bio or Avident, whatever software they have, they can now pick those points on the patient's preoperative photo and align them with a cast. And now that cast is pulled into the virtual articulator at the patient's exact plane of occlusion. So you've now copied the patient's curve of speed, curve of Wilson, plane of occlusion, um, the condylar relationship, and it's amazing the amount of data you can get from one full face photograph. <laughs> so this is a dental student case uh, where he was doing an immediate denture. This was the one that was in the scan earlier. So they, <laughs> the student came to me and he said he was extracting, I think, 20 teeth or something crazy and delivering baxillary and mandibular immediate dentures. And the only thing more scary than you delivering the immediate dentures is your fourth year dental student. <laughs> delivering the immediate dentures. And it wasn't even a dental student that was going into props. He was going into ortho. So it's like, come on, man. Um, so we ended up doing this case virtually. And this was probably the easiest denture seat that we've done in the student clinic and probably easier than most of the ones I've done in practice, to be completely honest. And this was following that carbon protocol. Um, again, I have... I don't get any money from him. I, this is not a bias thing. In my very limited clinical experience since quarter four, 2019, I've been super impressed with the digital luc lucitone and that's it of that. And that's probably has as much to do with the carbon and the three shape software as it does to do with the resin. So the work, the software is getting better and better and the materials are getting better and better and everything's getting more and more predictable, which I think is so cool. All right, so the last workflow I will walk through is the digital denture or duplicate denture technique. And this is, again, my, my third favorite. So these are my three favorite workflows. I get equally excited about any of them because I'm a geek and I love dentures and I love printing. Um, so when your patient comes in with a set of dentures, don't go back and start from alginate. Save yourself a chair visit, save that cost of chair time, um, save the patient a trip down the road and use that data. So even if the patient hates their dentures, you can find out why they hate their dentures. Is the tooth too long? Are the teeth too far out? Do they show too much pink? Do they not show enough pink? Whatever it is, if you take their existing denture and capture that data vir virtually, you have that to go from. So <clears throat> for this, you basically will just paint your denture with tray adhesive. And don't worry, this wipes right off with alcohol gauze if you can get alcohol again. <laughs> Uh, so you'll paint your denture base with tray adhesive. You're going to border mold and take a wash impression just like it's a custom tray. So this is where you're picking up the border molding. And then if the patient allows, you can take your upper and lower wash impression, take a centric relation record, measure what you want to do to the vertical dimension, open and close it, whatever. And then you can send it to the lab for them to pour and duplicate. But they might not like that. So if you have an intraoral scanner, you can actually use your intraoral scanner, whether it's an iTero or a 3Shape or a Medit or a CareStream, whatever you have, you can actually scan the dentures um, outside the mouth. The other thing you could do is uh, you could take the impression, leave the room, have your assistant scan this. If you have a scanner and let's say you buy the $265 AnyCubic off of Amazon, you can have your assistant print the duplicate of the dentures. And I'll walk through that too. Uh, this would be what the printed duplicate would look like. So if you have any cheap printer, and truly the AnyCubic right now is on sale last time I checked on Amazon for 260 bucks. Again, I get no money from anybody <laughs> um, except for University of North Carolina, and I'm very grateful for that. Uh, go Heels. So you can have your assistant scan the denture and print it on any printer, and now you have probably the most accurate custom tray and record base that you could ever imagine. Um, so you can grind on this, you can add to this, you can 
take a wash inside this. You can grind the occlusion away and take a fresh CR. Uh, it's basically a very, very accurate record base. Um, if you do have an intraoral scanner, I would love everybody to Google on YouTube Valerie Cooper denture cupcake technique, and you have to put denture or you're going to get a bunch of videos about frosting cupcakes, which is also really cool, but it'll make you hungry and we don't want to get the quarantine fatigue. So um, Valerie Cooper does a cupcake technique basically where you wash the upper and lower dentures, you scan them, and then you scan a bite. And she actually uses her three shape to scan the face and kind of do a real quick and dirty version of a face scan that can actually get merged into the three shape software. So this is my patient that came in with his existing denture that we scanned and that scan data, I scanned it outside the mouth, that is purple. So, and then we have the proposed tooth setup where we're adding a little bit of length, which is white. And so now I have him mounted virtually on an articulator in the three shape software. We virtually set the teeth and now we can print our try in. And this is again where I think removable is going is these monolithic try ins. They're easy to fabricate. Once you get used to them and get past that learning curve, they're pretty easy to work with. And you don't have to worry about wax melting to and from the lab or when the patient bites down, which is also very stressful when you try to check occlusion and all the teeth fall out. That doesn't happen with a monolithic denture. So uh, it looks just like this. It's solid white usually, um, depending on the lab you work with. Sometimes they use a stock shade, which is like a bleach white, solid white. Sometimes they'll use the shade. Uh, that's usually a little bit more expensive. If you want to try in an A1, A2, A3, Avident will do that. Um, and a lot of the full service labs that have the higher end printers will do that for you. But this allows you, again, unlike a triad tray with a bunch of fixident in the bottom of it, this allows you to truly evaluate the function and aesthetics because it fits like a denture base. So you can have the patient say 55, 66, do your sibilants and fricatives and all the stuff you learned in dental school. So none of that was a waste of education. It's just now we're applying it differently. Uh, you can see how things fit. You can grind on these. If you need to do, uh, you can, if you really want to, you can do a clinical remount and remount these on a literal articulator and grind them in. So really, um, it's a really cool, versatile workflow. And so this is basically us trying it in. If they fit perfectly and you don't need to make any modifications, send your patient home with them. And I think a really cool story is one of our dental students did a monolithic try-in right before we ended up closing the school. Uh, and that patient now is wearing her monolithic try-ins during this COVID-19, which is a really cool thing because otherwise she'd be without teeth for these several months. And now she's with all white teeth, but their teeth. Um, we talked about changes to retention earlier. So let's say that your try in doesn't fit the way you want your definitive denture to fit. You just uh, wash it till it does. Uh, and so same as when you're taking a border molded final impression and you want to have that little retention when you remove the tray same thing from here you want this to fit as tightly or as retentively as your definitive denture would sometimes you're way off and this is me in my case so see sometimes dentures are hard but instead of sitting here and modifying and moving 28 teeth in wax I draw on it with a sharpie take a photo and send it to my lab. And we actually went straight to final on this case and it looked great because we had all that information transferred virtually. So you can even do a short appointment with a sucky try in <laughs> unlike what you could see with a conventional denture where you're working through and trying to reset 28 teeth. Uh, you can modify anything. So again, this is just a super fancy record base. Uh, you can grind the teeth away and get a new CR if your vertical is too open. Uh, you can modify the extensions if you're overextended. You can wash it if it's underextended. Let's, the heels are getting in the way when you go to index cursives. Grind those down. Grind this down until you're happy with the fit and function. And then if your bite's way off, grab a new bite. And then send that back to your lab, and they'll scan that in and redesign it. And you'll end up with um, a digital preview that shows the old versus the new setup. Um, <clears throat> so this back to my patient that we did our insertion. And this is... <laughs> I, I like to tell this story because he came in from, um, he was one of the first patients I saw in North Carolina here. And he came in from, I came from Atlanta where everybody wanted teeth that are the color of the background of this slide. And when they weren't this color, they made me redo them brighter. Uh, and so he came in and he said he didn't like the color. And I said, well, I don't, you know, if we go a little brighter, I don't think it's going to look very natural. Um, and he was like, what do you mean brighter? I want it darker. And I literally sat down <laughs> and had to like, 
calm myself because he's the first patient I've ever seen that wanted darker teeth ever in my like 15 years of practice. <laughs> but the great news is if that were a conventional denture, we'd have to send that back to the lab, start over from tooth try-in at least, if not MMR. But here I call the lab and I say, hey, man, I'm sorry. I said I wanted A1. I actually want A2. And then they reprint a denture and I get the exact same denture in a different shade in three days. So, and not going through any of the steps and zero extra minutes of chair time. And since I already adjusted his denture and inserted it, made sure it didn't need adjustments, the post insertion is super easy. I just hand it to him and say, here you go. It's the new one in a different color. <laughs> so I don't know if you could tell, but I really like digital dentures. And the, one of the main reasons I like it is that retention of information, the digital transfer of information from the photos to the scans, um, whether they're clinical or lab scans, and the minimizing number of visits and that access to care aspect that's so critical in complete dentures. Um, and again, there's so many different workflows you can use. And so when you fabricate dentures, if you love wax rims, man, don't get rid of your wax rims. If you love setting teeth, you can actually still set teeth and have those scanned in. Anything you like, you can keep. Anything you don't like, print it. Uh, this is my Instagram. If you want to follow me, most of what I show is going to be digital dentures. So I'm at Dr. Wendy's World. Um, there will be occasional pictures of my, my little boys. But again, usually, usually dentures. Um, and I'm happy to answer questions. Dr. Wendy Clark, wow. You just make us so <laughs> proud. You are <laughs> absolutely adorable. If anybody has an idea what's going on at the UNC <laughs> Adams you. School of Dentistry, this is why Dr. Clark was named the Hunt Award for the top professor at the dental school. And, Thank uh, you. The only thing I can say, anybody from any other dental school that's watching this, you can't have her. She's ours. <laughs> And, uh, I no, man, I'm not moving, sorry. Faculty, when, when I was in school, it was a bunch of wrinkled old grumpy men. <laughs> and Dr. Clark is just a star. And, you know, uh, Dr. Thank you. Wonderful, You're, wonderful. The chat has blown up with just how excited you have made people about dentures. Good, good. <laughs> That's my goal that in life. <laughs> That's my you, goal in life. You uh, are a true little treasure. And I say little because you, you look like you would be a first year student. <laughs> thank you. I appreciate that. I have on the touch up my appearance feature of Zoom. <laughs> I'm really a grumpy old wrinkled prophet on it. <laughs> AB, can I confess two years ago when I joined the faculty and saw Dr. Clark? Yeah. I said some stupid like, you know, how was your summer break or <laughs> are you enjoying dental school? And she's like, yeah, I'm... It'd be hard not to. I was like, she's like, hold on, I'll be teaching you in a minute. There we go. <laughs> so I would love to ask you, and I don't want to put you on the spot, but do you also present on removable partial dentures? I don't have as much material on partials as I do on complete, so I wouldn't have it handy. I have an amazing colleague, Dr. Ingeborg de Kock, who uh, Mark Hyman could probably vouch for also, and she has a lot of partial stuff that's really Okay, because there's a lot she of questions partial about that, so I didn't want to talk. I can answer her. questions about it. I just don't have Dr. a lot Clark, of material. Dr. Clark, what she's asking is, would it. you come back and do another session? <laughs> I will, but maybe not on partials. <laughs> Perfect. I will do my begging via email normally, but I'm not ashamed. You got it. Wendy, very you got cool it. presentation. Very cool. Thank you. I Thank appreciate you. that. You know, one of the things that, that one of the quick partial uh, questions that you might answer is, can you use this with valplast, things like that? Is it, are there yes. any application? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And you can partial. actually mill Duraflex and mill flexible partials now. Um, and I, I work with Olson Lab in particular for that um, treatment plan where they will actually mill me Duraflex whenever I want it. Um, and there's, again, a lot of other labs that will do that as well. But you can design and you can mill Duraflex. Yeah, a couple of And you can actually that... print frameworks too. You can print metal okay. frameworks now with um, SLM, the selective laser melting and selective laser printing. So any partial denture you do can be done virtually. If you do a printed framework, you still have to do a wax tooth trying because you can't attach the teeth to it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Very cool. And then a couple of things that I keep popping up is, can you mention a couple of printers that, again, that people could use and then software too, other than 3Shape? Uh, are there yeah, other for sure. softwares that, 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 are, that are more... Uh, more user friendly. Yeah, <laughs> yes. Uh, there are there are so many different options, and so 
for printers, it depends what you want to do. Um, if you want to do a lot of in-house, like let's say you want to actually print night guards and print temporaries and print provisionals, you're going to want to go for some, one of the higher end middle ones, like the Asiga from Whitmix. It's phenomenal, and, but it has about a $10,000 price point. Um, if you want to just kind of get your toes dipped in the water for printing, um, the Moonray is really nice uh, from Sprint Ray. Um, the form is fine. It's a little bit slower, but it still has a really nice product at the end. I think probably of that middle ground, the Whitmix Asiga is one of the top, um, gets the best reviews. Uh, and I would love to refer everybody to Marco Tadros, T-A-D-R-O-S on Facebook. He has a really wonderful resource for shopping for printers. Um, if you really don't know if you want to get involved in printing yet, but you just want to play a little bit, I would recommend um, the Anycubic Photon, which you can get on Amazon for anywhere between two and $500, depending on which model uh, you want to go with. You can use the Dentka resins, which are the FDA cleared resins, in even those $400 printers. So you could get a $400 printer, a bottle of resin, and you can actually print your try-ins or print custom trays or print um, record bases in-house. Uh, as far as software, there's a ton of options. I think probably the most uh, utilized right now would be Blue Sky Bio has a denture module on it that is it's free to design and then you pay per click. So you're going to pay to print something or pay to, pay to export the STL or pay to send it to your lab. But all the design component of Blue Sky Bio is free uh, of charge. Exacad also has a really nice denture module my only caveat with that is i'm interested to see what happens with exacad because they were just purchased by align um, and so i don't know what the aligned exacad marriage is going to mean for um, how open source they are right now and what scanners they can work with and all that but exacad has a really wonderful denture design software and the blue sky bio i think would be the first one i would send people towards dentka and pala um, are the same and dentka has a really nice program as well if you want to kind of dip your toes in the water again dent has a really nice company to look into they had the first fda cleared resin uh, on the market they were kind of the first kind of the forefathers of digital um, dentures with the printing aspect of it awesome thank you so much all right well, well, through we will... my entire career of things uh, dentures were always the most unpredictable you know made me pull my hair out i actually have more hair than most of the guys on this panel i think mark and i are the only ones <laughs> uh, you can't get people saying, mark I, i'm right there with you i you. win but baby in truth a, as i'm going through this and i saw it within the chat a number of times as well it gets you excited to start to try new things with dentures for something that's a lot more predictable than yeah. what it has been now, yeah. there was a comment made just moments ago about how somebody wishes that they had not gone to school 10 years ago and that they're now behind <laughs> the curve with digitizing their dentures. But it's the learning curve is not that terribly advanced to try and jump right. into, it, correct? Mm -hmm, correct. And it's super easy. So it, it, and it's low stakes because if it doesn't fit, you can print another one. And most full service labs are really excited to kind of jump into this as well. So I would also refer you to whoever is currently making your dentures and ask if they have a digital option. So I say, I know Huntsville Oral Arts in Huntsville, Alabama is wonderful. Uh, New Image in Atlanta is phenomenal. Um, Absolute Dental in Durham, uh, North Carolina is great. Uh, I really, my hat's off to BJ Kowalski at Row Dental Lab does a ton. Um, so I think they're all really great. Um, and I would like to give one shout out if I can to all of my senior dental students. I hope some, some of them are watching and not just the ones at UNC, but the ones across the country that are not getting their graduation this month. I'm virtually hooding you <laughs> if I can. And I hope that you guys all get to celebrate because you guys have more than earned it. I think class of 2020 is the, the class of resilience. And so um, I wish them all the best of luck and hope they have a wonderful celebration.